Hey, what's up? Welcome to Talkies. Uh, we are three filmmakers talking about movies. Uh, and today, uh, well, today I'm D. I don't know about other I'm days. I'm still but Kenny. Today I'm D. No, no, no. We oh, are you're D, D too? Yeah, I got a D today. Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. I'm sorry, well, I'm Taylor. I'm Taylor. Are you both played by <laughs> Naomi Watts? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That make that makes more <laughs> Very sense. Very talented dual role. Um, usually in these episodes, one of us will pick a movie that the other two have not watched, and then we'll discuss it. Kenny did a little strange thing last Weird. time, and he was like, "Hey, so how about I choose a movie that I haven't seen? You guys have." So I was like, "I'm gonna do the same thing." So <laughs> I chose uh, Mulholland Drive, which I have never seen, but these guys mm-hmm. have. So that's what we're that's talking a fact. about today. You've seen it now, though. Right, I've now and, yeah I've seen it twice. And you cannot now. unsee it. Unsee I, I can't unsee yeah, it's it. It's nope. one of those movies you can't nope. unsee it. Yeah, so <laughs> big, big regrets for watching it. Yeah, yeah. sorry yeah, about giant, that. Just yeah. huge regrets. Uh, uh, so the first time I saw Mulholland Drive it was maybe like two years ago, and it was at Taylor's uh, suggestion, and I watched it like but like starting at like one in the morning, right. <laughs> and and I and it felt so surreal and confusing and dreamy uh, and I just went well it is David Lynch but it's also it's the middle of the night so I'm not going to worry too much about the fact that I don't understand what's happening I just chalked it up to <laughs> chalked it up to middle of the night <laughs> movie watching and then and then I watched it again today and uh, and had the exact same sensation <laughs> so is this is just a <laughs> you're like i don't know what's going this, on this is just, yeah <laughs> I, I yeah well anyways let's go into hot takes <laughs> all right uh let's do hot takes uh tay give us your your hot take man hot take i have so much to say <laughs> about this movie um my hot take initially is that i love this movie a lot i'm a big fan of this movie it's a very very strange movie it is strange, and I, I feel like my, the only I can't I can't say more without going too deep. So my hot <laughs> take is that I love the movie. Mm. Dope, mm. Kenny. Give us your hot. My take. hot take is I also love this movie. I uh, I, I want it. I'll go ahead and say that it's better than Eraserhead. Eraserhead's still my favorite David Lynch, but but I'd say it, I feel like this is his masterpiece. Um, uh, absolutely adore it. Don't understand it. And don't even care. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have a lot to say about this movie. My hot take, though, is that I wish I liked it more. I think you've said that with all the David Lynch movies. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's exactly what (laughs) David Lynch is that way for me. Uh, I want to start off by saying that my, my journey with this movie is very strange because it's pretty much... It's a key moment, a key turning point in my entire perspective of David Lynch's film filmmaking, where I I was getting into him and I was like, all right, let's give David Lynch a shot. He's this guy I heard a lot about and everyone likes him a lot. So I, the first movie, David Lynch movie I tried watching was Mulholland Drive. I literally got 45 minutes into it and I couldn't take it anymore. I, I decided that I did not like David Lynch. I was like, okay. David Lynch is not for me at all. Like, I, I actually hate this. <laughs> That's very strange hearing that from you. That's very yeah, strange. Yeah, so I, after that point, I actually I wrote off David Lynch for a little bit. And, and it wasn't until I got into Twin Peaks and then saw Eraserhead and Blue Velvet and then worked my way back up to Mulholland <laughs> Drive that I start to like feel like I understood what his style was like I started to understand that the absolutely awful ADR at the airport scene in the beginning (laughs) is not necessarily unintentional and definitely played into but it's just it's it's assulting to my preconceptions (laughs) yeah Yeah, well it's right it's all in line with what we've talked about in previous Lynch episodes about about he has you know, he's one of those filmmakers who is is just unapologetic with his a- aesthetic. You yes. Know, his 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 signature unapologetic look, with his his aesthetic, aesthetic is is <laughs> in your face. He has yes. his way of doing things. You can't 
you can't accidentally meander through a David Lynch movie and find out <laughs> you're never surprised by the director title. Like, oh, that was a Lynch movie. No, it's like <laughs> it's like you're either watching a Lynch movie or someone trying to be David uh, Lynch. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is yeah, so very clear. And this one, you know, from the very first spoken words of the movie, you're like, oh, yeah, the wooden dialogue. The, like, completely wooden very minimalistic dialogue that doesn't really even seem to be making an effort to to pass as realism that is a david lynch <laughs> signature you know that's yeah. it's part yeah. of the ride yeah, yeah it is yeah so it took yeah it took a while and yeah now i love it and david lynch is literally like one of my favorite directors ever now and it took i feel i feel like i've had the same experience i had with 2001 a space odyssey that I'm having with Mulholland Drive, where each Interesting. each time I've watched it, I've I've developed a stronger interpretation of what happens in the movie. I, now I yeah. just watched it this last time, and I was like, I know exactly what happens in this movie. That's like, funny. I, I want to hear that because honestly, I feel like 2001 is a more graspable movie <laughs> than this. I really do. Like, and a part of that is. Um, uh, What's her name? Naomi Watts. Yeah. Her role or roles were played so distinctively from one another that it actually took me a little while to realize it was her in both roles. Like when she first mm. showed up. I, I kind of had a little bit. When of she same, first showed up, yeah. I'm like, she looks a lot like Naomi Watts' character. <laughs> but it took a little bit. I'm like, wait, oh, it's the that same. is Naomi yeah. Watts. Yeah. Like I had to kind of talk myself yeah. into it almost. And then I'm like, what is going on here? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, David Lynch movie. Stop trying to solve the puzzle and go along. And just let the dream f flush over you, you know? <laughs> so, uh, Mulholland Drive is uh, in the Criterion Collection, which I didn't mm -hmm. know. Um, and it's often, like, uh, everywhere that I have a taste profile, uh, it's always recommended to me. Uh huh. Um, all the time and so I, that when I first watched the movie it uh, um, it did the same thing that Enemy did to me in the first first time I mm -hmm. watched it where I was like oh yeah I know what this is I know what's happening and then then the reveal but then the reveal is a completely different reveal but, than what you thought it was going to be yeah and then I was just like holy crap and that just changed everything for me and I'm like I gotta rewatch this whole thing yep. so I, I did and uh, and yeah but the so this is the strange thing about David Lynch movies with me is that what you were talking about, Kenny, with the, the wooden dialogue and whatnot, that is his signature, and it really pulls me out of the movie. And it's as if, I think it's kind of like, like if my wife were to watch Enemy, she would hate it, but it's because of the tone that she would hate it, and it's because of the tone that I love that movie. <laughs> and it's like the signature of david lynch is what i hate about david lynch movies i love the maholan drive script the story and the way it's presented the way it's even acted sometimes is freaking amazing like some of the stuff going on in here is so awesome the way that i watched it the second time it was like uh i don't know if or the first time it was i don't know if i like this movie holy crap i love this movie i don't know if i like it again <laughs> it was just a lot of that and because of the the signature of his movies that just doesn't emotionally connect with me it takes a lot of effort like a lot of effort for me to jump over the gaps and to fill in my own information you know where it usually would have been totally fine with like Denis or I don't know someone else like that but yeah not with David Lynch like it's it's so hard for me to do it so then all the all these things keep popping out to me where I'm just like uh, that acting's not so good uh, why nah. that shot choice uh, well, <laughs> why'd you leave out that information you know Honestly, it's easier for me to get into a movie <laughs> like like a Lynch film where I don't know I, I feel like it's easier to kind of kind of let like I said let the dream just sort of rush over you and uh, the the analytical hat kind of takes a back seat because I, I feel like I'm more in a I'm more in a watercolor painting or a, a, a poetic experience than I am in. A traditional cinematic. Experience. I wish Eraserhead was that way for yeah. me. Eraserhead was uh, almost purely a tone poem for me because, 
because it had an overall theme of responsibility and same with like mother one that i keep coming back to is it, there's this overall theme in there which can be interpreted in many different ways but the whole point is that there's a theme and not necessarily all the things in the story are talking about one whole story but rather just connecting back to a tone or to a theme or whatever and i really like those experiences but <laughs> the analytical mind of mine made everything in this movie make sense so when i was watching the movie that there's never a point that i felt lost i was just feeling like incomplete i i i I wrote down a summary of what happens in this movie, and it was, it's convoluted as hell. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> I wouldn't that even want to tackle it. that. That sounds rather <laughs> tedious. <laughs> it, it, it was funny because it didn't feel like. I mean, like I just wrote yeah. it down, and just like, well, that's what happens, and I'm like, holy crap! And I looked at the page, and I'm like, that's that's incredible. <laughs> and there's so many things happening, um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I I connect with it. I'm mean, not con- I, I connect with it analytically, not emotionally. It's yeah, the information in here is not the way that connects with me i do like what he does though i mean like i feel like the sequences are masterful taylor uh i want to hear your interpretation of 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 this story yeah you just suggested you just suggested something that's very foreign to me and that that this this has a concrete meaning that one can explain <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it makes perfect sense to me yeah, too. I, I, uh, you, okay, you have to let me know if uh, if you agree here. Um, I think that the first two hours of the movie is a dream sequence. I think that we are seeing Diane dreaming, and she envisions herself as another person named Betty, mm-hmm. who is the the her wildest dreams, all her hopes and dreams manifested everything she ever wanted from being an actress. I think Diane is a failed, uh, struggling actress. And I think she fell into a, an affair that couldn't go very far or far with Camilla Rhodes, who then Camilla Rhodes went on to be way more successful for her than her and broke her heart. And I think Diane, um, hired a hitman to kill Camilla Rhodes. And then through that guilt, probably induced that dream that we see for the two hours where she's like envisioning Camilla as Rita who is this person she's like her ideal version of this affair and like going through her fantasy world and then it slowly like crumbles as they investigate as she's investigating deeper into her own like her she's you know they're trying to figure out who Diana is and she is Diana. Betty is Diana, and she it all unravels at a point. And I think she kills herself in the end. That's her body's there. Uh, and so when when uh, Rita opens the blue box, that's kind of the switch, the transition yes. from the fantasy exactly. to the real. Correct. Yeah. Uh, that's almost exactly what what I wrote down. Also. Um, the uh there's a couple things i I would disagree theory wise and this is i think the reason why this movie is so widely loved is because it can have so many interpretations and they all work Um, the uh the the first two hours being the dream is what i first thought and then upon the second viewing i was like actually it feels more like uh, a fever dream that someone has just before they die and so i was i was thinking that because she already met like in the last part of the movie she met all those people and then all those people are in her dream um if she had uh if she had dreamt this before then she wouldn't have known all those people you know unless she was having premonitions but then that's the whole filmmaking aesthetic of of uh of david lynch is that if she did have premonitions that would be a david lynch Mm -hmm. thing that'd be totally fine to do uh the other thing was um oh when they have the switch with the key in the box and stuff which by the way that key i i paused the movie several times to try to figure out how that key inserted and turned because that was the triangle left me up key yeah i didn't really understand how that could work (laughs) that's Uh, actually it's a different shot keys look like and for high security uh deposit boxes oh -hmm. really in uh, in in that uh sequence the 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 keyhole turns when she turns it but then when they have a close-up the keyhole is reversed like the like it's a different box entirely 
So I thought that was just weird. <laughs> anyway, point was when she unlocked it, and then uh, just before Rita or Camille, Camilla uh, unlocks it, Diane disappears, and then Camilla opens it, and then she disappears, and then Ruth comes back. But Ruth is supposed to be dead at this point. So what is <laughs> whose perspective? Is this a live Ruth coming into a room that sees no one? <laughs> I don't know whose perspective that is. I think that's David Lynch's perspective. Ruth, uh, and then dead? when it transitions away from her to uh, to what's her name's to Diane's bedroom, it it retransitions back to the same room and then comes back again, as if they're trying to say something. I'm not I'm not sure if they're actually trying to say anything. Uh, lots of these little details are in here, which I I just didn't understand why they were there. I think there. that's just the transition from dream to reality. But, but I mean, like... It reminded me of uh, the end of 2001 A Space Odyssey, actually, when when we're going from oh, yeah. age, the age progression. But, like, why is Ruth... There? I mean, I know I'm asking the wrong questions here, but why is Ruth there? And Isn't why does she house? see nobody? <laughs> it is her house, but Ruth is dead. When what? did Ruth die? This is... At the beginning, Diane says that her... Or not in the beginning, the end... Diane says that her uh, her aunt is deceased. Diane says that. Yeah. Well, it could be um, it could be the apartment. It could be like like a different person. It might not be Ruth, even though it's the same person. In the same way that we get Coco in reality, who is a completely different person, but is still real. She's just someone in the same house. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, it could be as a way to link to link the so. location and explain where it came it's from it's just like a dreams. quick way of saying what you thought happened in this space never actually happened right it just it felt weird to have because if she's deceased it just felt weird to bring her back in that moment it would feel better to have coco in that moment come over and say oh well that's weird anyway that, that's that's a uh, moot point um there's a what there was something else i wanted to talk about i can't remember what it was Anyway, someone else have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> this movie has some of my absolute favorite individual scenes in terms of just just, just standalone scenes. It has some of the, my favorites of all movies. Yeah, uh, just a few. The to name off the top of my head, the 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 first sequence with the hitman dude, where he where he's trying to get the guy's black book, and and we <laughs> yeah. have this like. The bumbling hitman. It's bumbling hitman sequence. That was <laughs> that was so just weird. Wonderful. <laughs> like, oh, I man. loved that <laughs> so much. Then there was uh, the scene with the cowboy. <laughs> it's that so fucking good. I was love that. so <laughs> freaking awesome. I loved that. Uh, the first scene at Winkies. That's so good. That's where they so talk almost. about the That's nightmare like yeah. that. That could just have been up. a standalone short film. Yeah, it all could by have been, itself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and honestly, it kind of is. Yeah, it doesn't. It's, it's, it's not it's, really. It's, it doesn't ever, seem to really connect. Except for the, the old lady comes back, but yeah, the 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 yeah. gargoyle behind the yeah. alley back there. Uh, <laughs> I, I'd have nightmares about that. Um, <laughs> that scene is so unnerving. <laughs> yeah, it really it's crazy. is. It's, it really is. I like everything. I like everything that scene stands for. But as far as like the, I mean, I. I've explained. <laughs> anyway, I like it. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the director coming home and finding the pool man. That that whole s- sequence it's, and was it's Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> That's no way to treat your woman, no matter what she done to you. <laughs> what, what was uh, so the the hitman when he was walking with that blonde girl? Was that supposed to be? So, like somebody. I don't know. That sounds like that was part of uh, real reality, not um, mm-hmm. not, not it, dream. It, yeah, it could well, be I, that during like the they might cut out of the dream at times. Yeah, I, I think I think so. Because that's kind of what I thought. I kind of figured the hitman was hit asking was about brunettes, right? Yeah, which he was looking for. Yeah, he was probably that was probably the reality of oh. of. Was that Diane? No, then? Th- I think that was the hitman looking for Diane's target, getting some 
Well, who who was the blonde girl then? Someone who works uh, the street. Someone on the street. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just yeah. just a random yeah, character. Yeah, random character to Hooker. provide information to Hitman. Hooker's got the down low. They know. They know things. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. There are so many just scenes like that, and then the whole like stage show sequence. That's crazy. Was so wild. I I loved that so much, and I was surprised at how much time. The, that Lynch was willing to give that sequence. Um, it was cool. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely say, though, even though I have a strong interpretation, I, I, and li- reading on, on Wikipedia, I was looking it up, and there's a whole section for interpretations, and it seems like that is uh, a very popular interpretation, the, the dream reality thing, Hitman mm-hmm. thing. Um, it still doesn't answer for every scene like there are still scenes that are like yeah. don't like uh don't add up yeah to a well, con- concrete I, narrative I think, you know yeah i think that's kind of the thing about uh, I mean, which David is Lynch yeah i think intentional is, yeah i mean same with enemy like i don't think there's one there's one explanation for any of it because it is art yeah it's it's not supposed to be one completive you know story uh I wanted to say, oh, the the opening sequence, the jitterbug. <laughs> oh yeah, um, that threw me through such a big loop. It's <laughs> only like uh, it's only like three couples that are superimposed over each other. I read about that because yeah, the, I was scratching my head so long for that. Uh, <laughs> and there's actually a whole website called MahalanDrive.net. Oh yeah, that it's just full of interpretations, cool. yeah, and theories and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that opening sequence, they said that it could have been. And there's four couples, and one of them, only one person, has red hair at any moment. And it, they seem to say that it's Diane's. Uh, <laughs> it could be her vision of her uh, winning the uh, jitterbug contest because she she, she did, did say did later on that she that. won yeah, that contest. Right. Yeah, but because she's not really present in that scene, it might just be made well, up, or it might. It be, also fits in with the aesthetic of the movie that um that the director is making yeah that's so like i I had thought this was just like a like a select like a lifted piece from (laughs) from that movie that she's auditioning for you know oh yeah yeah. because it's like a it's like a 50s early 60s yeah dude yeah and those scenes are good too when they're the music Mm -hmm. when they're doing bring it that dan or uh betty comes in sees camilla the other Camilla doing the part. Those music numbers are awesome. I just love it. All the reverb. Yep. This is the girl. And the way Dude. they look back and forth. <laughs> I freaking loved loved that that first scene with the when when they have the boardroom meeting. Oh. The espresso. Uh, with the espresso. Oh my god, dude! It's so talk about amazing. dad theory. That was the most dad theory <laughs> thing I've ever seen. With the espresso, he just <laughs> letting it dribble out of his mouth. And I'm like, oh my gosh! I, I like the part when they when when they he the whoever gives him the espresso comes over and puts the espresso down, and and he goes napkin <laughs> like like he's almost he's like furious but also like yeah. embarrassed that. He didn't give him a napkin. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> the that same uh, scene. I can't remember who the actor is, but that actor who who's sitting there like this the whole time. Yeah, just in the distance. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then after the espresso part, and everyone starts apologizing. He just stands up and he just yells. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he just. He's, yeah. he's the guy from <laughs> Blood Simple. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, he. What, yeah, oh, he's, he's the, the, I've seen him he's, in many other things. Frank, you know the bad guy from Blood oh, Simple. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. shit. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. That is funny. Anyway, yeah. yeah. That whole thing. The whole. Uh, I feel like Lynch has like a. He has a, such a strong taste for um, what do you call it? Like red backdrop, like stage and yeah. areas. Like it's and, in yeah. it's yeah. Head, it's in Twin Peaks. Yeah. And yeah. This. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He he has these like. Uh, uh, you know, it's almost like Wes Anderson with his like dollhouse thing. You know, yeah, yeah. It, it's there. There's these calling cards that he he uses everywhere. Yeah. You know. uh, quick little side fact: the the espresso guy, that that actor, is actually not an actor. He's actually Angelo Bedalamenti, 
who is the composer of the film and oh. David Lynch is oh. composer for like everything. Oh, I liked the, well, I liked the, the, the music. The yeah, I, I think I was the surprised. Score he's like stands good as, out in this one. Yeah, his, his score is always really cool. And he's yeah. also good as fuck in that role. Yeah, <laughs> that he tiny is. role. <laughs> In that scene, when they showed the director had this golf club sitting in front of him on the desk, like I immediately thought, okay, there's some kind of real surreal David Lynch thing happening. We're going to find out this guy's carrying a golf club around and it's going to be for one specific reason. Like I just knew that was coming. <laughs> I'm like, he's yeah. going to bash in someone's car or something. <laughs> I like how he stands up. He's like, what is going on here? Everyone's like freaking out about that was, espresso. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love, I really, really love the interpretation of of uh, of how like the first two hours being a dream sequence and everything, of the motivation behind it. Because in my mind, in that last part, the very last part of the movie where we see the whole the true reality or whatever of uh, Diane and everything, when Diane interacts with uh, Camilla, Camilla is really dismissive uh, and it's obvious that they either had a relationship b- before or even even if it's just parasocial it's not actually a physical relationship but then we see camilla not only engaged to the director but also or assumed en- engaged uh but also like just kissing making out with that girl Witchers. who just came over in front of diane and also asking for diane to stay while he- she makes out with the director like she's a like, she's a yeah. bitch. <laughs> yeah. That's just that's very very rude. <laughs> All that stuff. So it made me think. No wonder she got her killed. Like, yeah. Well, I'm I'm thinking like like the whole the whole movie is supposed to be about Diane being a villain, but Camilla, I feel like is the actual villain here, or at least from her perspective. Read it that I've way. never thought about anybody yeah. being a villain in Mulholland Drive. <laughs> well, in <laughs> in uh in the Wikipedia okay. article, they talk about uh. Uh, it, it's the the way they describe the movie is Diane is a okay. villain, but I like the idea of Camilla being the villain, being such a, you know such a harsh personality that the only way to make sense of this whole thing is for <laughs> Diane to overreact to, to to only only overreacting is the only way we can I don't know get inside of her mind and try to figure out what exactly is tormenting her because I really like that full like like when she she paints out this reality as her being the girl who is like super popular and the director falls in love with her, you know, and everybody wants her. And the only way that Camilla ever got the role was because they were forced to yeah. give it to her, right? Like under threat yeah. of death. And I'm like, that's amazing. I love that stuff. Cause that, cause it speaks, it speaks so human <laughs> to, to, to quote Bob. It's a, uh, it felt a little forced, <laughs> but uh, but humanistic also. <laughs> yeah, I love that director in that scene. Yeah, <laughs> he, his yeah his lines were amazing. I I love I like that too. That uh, the old couple that brought her to the airport or were with her at the airport, Betty, at first, and then they leave and they're like obscenely giddy as they're driving uh-huh. away. That, that that was the first thing that began to unnerve me about this reality we were in. I'm like, yeah, nah, there's there's yeah. something weird going on. Here. Yeah, that's a very strange. Yeah. yeah, I felt like uh David Lynch. I think has like a little thing against old people. Same with uh, M Night Shyamalan. <laughs> yeah, using them like, as as horror instruments. Yeah, as horror. Uh, yeah, yeah. I well, that, that was, was really strange as heck at the end, uh, bringing them back as li- was, little yeah. tiny little tiny versions of them running yeah. under the door okay. and stuff. I, I got a I got a question about that. I don't know if David Lynch does this a lot, but I, I mean I know because uh, I've seen a Razorhead him doing like surreal elements and whatnot. But Taylor or Kenny or both you guys, uh, when this homeless dude or or whatever it is gargoyle mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, drops the bag that he, that has the the blue box in it, and then the camera zooms in to see the the small grandparents. Just just before they appear, the camera just slowly, really just goes in on the bottom of the box, and the box is unfocused. And what, we, what was in focus is the front of the bag with a soda can mm-hmm. tap and something that looks like about. it's meat. Yeah, on, some fleshy looking thing. Side. I saw that. So was that, I feel like that was completely on purpose. Is that something that Lynch does with his other movies where he focuses on 
unnerving material for a quite a long time before cutting away for no apparent reason? Um, yes. Because I, I, like I said, in Eraserhead, I felt like that happened. Kind of reminds but. me as of the like roaches in uh, Blue Velvet. Oh yeah, interesting. Lynch likes going into things. He always he does. Has, yeah. He's always going <laughs> into stuff. And yeah. <laughs> and so to me, the way I see that and the gargoyle, I. I also yeah. think I've noticed through Lynch's work is he also has these like abstract personifications of pure evil. Um, oh, interesting! And I believe that the gargoyle is that, and I, I think that's it. what the I cool. felt that people yeah. coming through is that as well. Yeah, yeah. I I like Kenny, like you said, the first like little short film that happened there at, at <laughs> Winkies was phenomenal it's so like, well acted. i really yeah it, <laughs> the floaty like, over the shoulder really well shots actually okay wait that's that's the that's a qualm i have with uh-huh. this movie uh david lynch does this thing about uh, where he does like kind of wooden acting and he does it a lot in uh the first couple episodes of twin peaks where people will say their lines but it seems as if they're auditioning for the role as opposed to delivering actual lines in the real world tell me you guys yeah understand that i identify that way too yeah right? uh, we've talked about that before i think it's a combination of the way he writes dialogue and the way he directs actors yep now with that being said uh, for, first of all is that guy john totoro is that is that who i'm thinking of in the in yeah, that's, that's not, no it's name? not john totoro but well, they have, they have similar name? eyebrows i don't though. know what his name is but he's a lynch regular anyway that guy yeah who is a lynch regular uh, that dude uh had such great performance really really good performance he did not feel wooden at all or as opposed to the guy who is talking to who does feel wooden completely and i feel like kubrick did this a lot too where they have wooden lines and not wooden lines and i don't know why because the wooden ones always take me out and the other ones feel really really interesting well the answer is he's not making the movie for you (laughs) <laughs> that's, well, that's the, th- the thing like I, that's what i love about lynch i love that he's like he he chooses to give actors these wooden lines and have them delivered in such a manner for for an an effect for a vibe for yeah. an atmosphere but then he what what is that vibe and atmosphere? it's ethereal dude it's abstract it's it's it's, it's a, a, you feel a great it, you know? example of it would be that scene Right after the car accident, where Robert Forster is the like uh, investigator. Oh, yeah. No, that's a right? great example. Him and yeah. the other guy are flat out giving like exposition. No, even dude, Robert Forster, even his character says, uh, "You yes. told me." Yes, to yeah, the other like guy. even acknowledges that you're t- <laughs> you are telling me something for the audience's, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and and yeah, to Taylor's point. Uh, it it's it's about it's like set dressing less than less than it is performance and that's what that's, i see there cuz i also cuz i really like how he can do that but then obviously he's in he also knows how to get like uh conventionally right. amazing performances he, out no, of yeah, people no right exactly right. i mean that's the same thing with kubrick yeah. i feel like kubrick does the same exact thing in uh specifically in uh freaking eyes watch yeah. Shut. Well, you know, I think this goes right in line with his art philosophy because we, we've talked about this before. How, you know, he, he has the famous uh, quote about how when he has an idea, maybe it's not meant to be a movie, maybe it's meant to be a painting or a song mm-hmm. or a sculpture. Yeah, yeah. And maybe within his movies, there are segments or pieces where he's like, I want to tell this part of the story through emotional performance this part of the story i should i should let the people kind of stay out of the way and i'm gonna i'm gonna build an atmosphere and maybe in this part of the movie it makes more sense to do something completely oddball like put on a stage show within the movie and i think most filmmakers are going to go no it's got to be cohesive where we do one we do it all the same way throughout because you know that's how movies work (laughs) most of the time (laughs) but but he's just not that way you know he he's I'm, I'm wondering, is that is there another director? There's got to be another director that does something like that besides Kubrick. I don't know. The like acting when, thing? When we talk about another yeah. like real strong, like people with like super strong oh, aesthetic. Oh, shit. You know what? What? 
uh, freaking <laughs> sign a kind of doty cody <laughs> so next to oh, andy New York. kaufman yeah andy kaufman or does that doesn't charlie he kaufman, well sorry. in uh charlie in, kaufman uh, uh, I'm thinking yeah, of I'm ending th- things. I'm thinking of ending that things. Did they did kind that of happen, too. I'd say. But uh, still, that movie still felt pretty cohesive yeah. tone-wise. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, for, more for someone like me. Less but I mean, severe, still the, less the, the intense. Yeah. yeah. Version. Yeah. Where they where they go between? Because like, what I loved about the way uh, Charlie Kaufman. Yeah. That's his name. Yeah. Yeah. The way Charlie Kaufman does it, and I'm thinking of ending things was. Uh, when they're in obviously the whole movies when they're in the car but when they're in the car and they're talking about uh the, the what do you call it the dairy queen blizzard uh, things uh-huh. that they just got uh and like how they'll switch personalities at random right where yeah. where uh one of them really wanted to go get him and then the other one didn't and then they switch suddenly and you're like i'm going insane i could have sworn she was the one who didn't want to but i like that because i acknowledged it in my head because I was like, oh, I see what's happening, but I, I can't do that with David. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's. So, I mean, too, it's like several layers deeper uh, of what Kaufman was doing there. Um, it's deeper. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he he does it more. He does it to a more intense level. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. well, much yeah. more intense. Yeah. I just I can't I can't even tell. Like I can intuit the reason for for Kaufman's yeah movies like uh synecdoche in new york i can intuit that when someone is speaking weird it's because they're acting because that's what the movie's about but uh in or actually even in eraserhead i could intuit because the whole thing feels like half dream half not the whole thing is surreal super surreal whereas maholland drive is like half grounded so it's it's i don't know it's harder for me i guess pretty surreal though oh it's very surreal yeah yeah like the like it's like it's literally yeah, it there, there was surreal. there was like yeah. i don't know five minutes into the movie i felt like oh this is this is a more of a grounded david lynch movie but then i i get it feels I gave to, up me, on that to me the only reason it's more grounded is because it it's shot in los angeles <laughs> oh yeah i want to mention that it feels way more grounded than something like eraserhead <laughs> Like Eraserhead has like a freaking monster baby in it, and like this is well, th- this there's nothing surreal. I mean, yeah, it kind of did. Yeah, it did. It have had a monster. a monster in it. I mean, like like when she shot herself, like all of a sudden there's this like curtain of smoke, smoke rises behind the bed, all dramatically, you know, stuff so like much. that. That's the best. Yeah, yeah. I, it felt surreal. I guess throughout. character motivation was grounded to me because like all, all their decisions made sense. I don't know sense. it started to break down though like like it got weirder and weirder you think about when they go to that stage <laughs> well, show and up to that point the only like weird oh, yeah, real sure. weirdness came from Rita's side because she was like oh I don't have a memory right and uh, Betty's been like the, the, the grounded reality person and then when we're in that sure. stage show and the lights start flashing Betty starts having like this seizure yeah and yeah. and and no one acts like it's odd they're just like well keep going right. with the show right. read it read yeah. it's like yeah, yeah just calm down <laughs> and i'm like okay it's like holy <laughs> shit the dream yeah. is imploding yeah yeah it's like inception the dream is collapsing yes <laughs> that, and that's what's so fascinating that's why we could talk about lynch for hours on any of his movies that that we cover because Christopher Nolan will make a movie that's explicitly about a dream within a dream, but he will employ characters yeah. to explain to you in great detail how it's a dream. But it's a not dream. about. I mean, <laughs> even though Nolan does do that, because he's not. Yeah, he doesn't make movies the same way. Like the 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 whole thing about any movie is about an emotional connection, and I, and the reason the way I connect with yeah. movies is specifically yeah. through yeah. visuals and through making sense of motivation. Uh, which is why there's only some of Kaufman's movies that I can relate to and why I almost can't relate to any of David Lynch's because my emotion, yeah. my emotional connection's yeah. not there. I, I actually was more emotionally moved by this than I was by Enemy. Same. Well, emotionally meaning like, like, like feeling like you're connected yeah. with as yeah. opposed to... Uh, I, I choose Enemy as a comparison because, no, yeah, because enemy, yeah. you know, it had... There's a lot of there's a lot of similarities between the two movies, except Enemy has yeah. more of the things that you connect to, and this has more of the absolutely. things that I connect to. Um, yeah, absolutely. If you could 
compare this movie to a pizza, what kind of pizza would it be? Totally easy, man. It's just it's just a yeah. slice of pizza that you've gotten at a street a, a corner. There's a corner place in uh, West Hollywood in the middle of the night, like like you're out with your friends. It's like two to three o'clock. You're in West Hollywood, where the only stuff that's going on out around you is like absolutely <coughs> surreal anyway, right? If you're out <laughs> in the streets in Hollywood at three a.m. It's like being in a Lynch movie <laughs> anyway. And you, you just you pick up a slice of pizza with, with Taylor and you, you're sitting there and, uh, and eating it. And that's what it is. And boy, this may, movie made me miss Los Angeles a lot. Because everyone I knew lived in apartments that looked like those. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Taylor. Uh... Uh... I don't know. Uh, okay. Okay, Devon. <laughs> uh, D. We're, we're going to go, go with your interpretation. Okay, okay. So here it is. Uh, when you're falling asleep and you're really, really, really hungry, but you don't want to get out of bed and you start to enter that dream state, you're like, no, 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 but I want to, I really want pizza. Then you, then you suddenly have pizza and you're starting to eat it and you're like, oh, that's good. And then, but then you wake up and realize you're not actually holding anything. And you're like, no, I could have, I thought I had pizza here. And so you get up and go, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to go make a pizza. And you just do the DiGiorno <laughs> thing and then come back to bed, go to take a bite. And then you wake up and you're just like, ah, oh, that's what this pizza was. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, I'd say I'd say Kenny's right here. This is definitely a pizza you get at the corner at 3 in the morning in Los Angeles. I think the thing I would add to that is probably on acid um, at the time. <laughs> and and uh, when you get the pizza... You go sit at, you know, like outside. I imagine we're like sitting outside on like a chair and table that's out there on like the sidewalk and some weird, weird stuff starts happening and you can't stop looking away and you're just watching and you never end up getting to eat the pizza. There it is. <laughs> that's it. There it is. And, and may, we all, may we all get to do that sometime. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys for listening to the talkies. This is talkies by Carmen line studios. We upload these every Friday. You can see us on Spotify and Apple podcasts and all of those podcast people. We're also on YouTube under the same name, Carmen line studios. So, uh, yeah, look forward to next week when Taylor, Taylor, no, no, decides we're on the movie. We already did. wait, wait, wait. Oh, we're, do- <laughs> we're doing something <laughs> next week. We're going to, we're going to have a surprise. I have to find four hours to watch it. This movie. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing <Jeez>. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs>